Okay. Okay, um, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's seminar. Today's seminar is jointly organized by the Plant Pathology Program and the UCR CAFE, which stands for California Agriculture and Food Enterprise. My name is James Ng. Um, I'm a faculty in the Department of Microbiology and Plant Pathology and host of uh, the Plant Pathology Seminar Series. And I've been looking forward uh, to today's seminar. I don't look very excited because that's because I'm self-isolating um, uh, with the suspected something. <laughs> so um, it's unknown yet, but in any case, uh, I've been very looking forward to this seminar, this cafe webinar. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn the virtual podium over to Deborah uh, to, do, to do the honor of introducing today's speaker. Deborah? Okay. Yeah. Hi, guys. So I'm the managing director of CAFE, and this is um, webinar number eight of the webinar series, which will end in the spring. Um, today, we have Dr. Diana Wall. She's a professor in biology in Colorado State University. Uh, she is a world-renowned uh, ecologist and the inaugural director of the School of Go Global Environmental Sustainability. Um, she, uh, Dr. Wall has been a driving force for connecting and building networks between faculty, researchers, students, and students by providing um, an innovating programs and tools to address uh, the world uh, complex and greatest sustainability challenges. Under her leadership, uh, she spur um, trans transdisciplinary collaboration um, the ones that have the ability to uh, really meaningfully address global issues and under our supervision and leadership, they strategically provide seed funding for diverse team of researcher, communication, leadership training for early career scientists, uh, but also they focus on re approach to sustainability education to create large effort to bring together people and not only the academic, but also the community through events that promote uh, discourse and discussion. She had an amazing career. She is uh, the, um, an elected member of the National Academy of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Science. And in 2013, she got the laureate of uh, uh, Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. Um, she's an ecologist and environmental scientist uh, she is uh, um, internationally recognized for her research documenting and exploring uh, the complexity of biodiversity in soil, the importance of biodiversity for ecosystem health, and the consequences of human activity on soil globally. And her research in agricultural and less management ecosystem has emphasized uh, uh, our life in soil from microbe to invertebrate contributes to ecosystem service. And that's what she's going to uh, focus today. Um, her big work, she um, has more than 25 years of research in the Antarctic. Um, and that work continued to clarify um, the critical link between climate change and soil biodiversity. And um, a very interdisciplinary research has uh, uh, uncovered dramatic the dramatic impact that um, to invertebrate community in response to uh, climate change and the role that nematode species play in the soil carbon turnover and how survive such an extreme environment. So I took some of you know the main achievements and now uh, without further delay, I will pass it to her to present this uh, um, very exciting uh, topic. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm going to kind of switch desktop here to hope so, so that we can get my slides up here. Did they, can you see those? Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, don't I'm worry, sorry. the computer, there is a glitch. Okay, well, I'll speed up now because I've wasted everybody's time, but, but um, I, I did want to say, first of all, I really am sorry I didn't get to come to Riverside 
I enjoyed spending my time with the nematology department there, and I certainly learned a lot, which you may not hear so much about. Um, I just wanted to show, start off by showing, and I can't even get my slides to go. Uh, yeah, showing this one that historically we have studied by discipline, everything in the soil that's living pretty much has been partitioned out by plant health or by veterinarians, uh, students or zoologists studying from animal health, looking at what has to do with health. And soil biodiversity has just been a kind of a reservoir where we look at uh, look for antibiotics or some way to make us well in the past. And then of course, we've looked at infectious disease and, and know that very well. Oh gosh. Um, so th there was the, the advice, uh, and this just shows you the disciplinary history of where we come from when Hippocrates said that physicians should pay attention to soil and what it might have in it. And of course, we're very aware of lots of uh, worms and fungi and the diseases they call because, cause because they're human diseases. So that goes back again to the fact that, you know, disciplines have studied what's living in soil. And some of the diseases, for example, that the World Health Organization follows are mentioned up here. There are a range of different kinds of life in the soil, whether it's worms, nematodes, or flatworms, or viruses, or bacteria, protease, fungi. That's all <clears throat> been directly working on what we know as humans and what, what would kill us. And so the historically, again, here's an example in Europe where they looked at soil organisms that would cause infections and then later death. And you can see that only a few countries were reporting, and this was in 2011. And this is the infection rate that they saw for human diseases. And then of course, if you're thinking about what the wildlife people or the veterinarians uh, see, there's a whole different scheme of that. But when we're thinking about sustainability, we have to think about all the biodiversity that's in soil, all the life in soil, and what does it do and how does it interact. In all these different disciplines that I've mentioned to you, whether it's plant pathology or veterinary medicine or wildlife zoology or um, uh, human, human health, animal health, human health, all of those Organisms are interacting in the soil, and yet we still study these from a very disciplinary focus, and we don't combine our knowledge to say what is really going on and what does this do for us. And so as we're facing the challenges in the environment right now, we really need to know, <clears throat> pardon me, we really need to know about what life in soil is doing for us and what would happen if we lose some of it, how can we manage it for the best plant growth, human health, et cetera. So one of the things that I wanna clarify right off the bat is what is biodiversity? And that according to the Convention on Biological Diversity is expressed as the variation in genes to ecosystems, to landscapes. So it's a very broad and encompasses all life. It just says, what is the variation that we're seeing? How much is there? And so these little silos that I've got here where the animals and the different, different um, organisms come out of them is something that we have to put together. But if you go back historically and say, let's talk about soils and what soils are and what forms soils and how long would it take to form soils? There were five factors of soil formation, relief, parent material, region, regional climate, and potential biota and over time. And this was, um, uh, definition by uh, Hans Jenny, who was at Berkeley at the time. And he, I, he knew then, in 1941, we knew that all these biota working together were affecting the rates of ecosystem processes, carbon and nutrient turnover. So then we found that relatively little knowledge, and he says this in his book, um, we know very little about it. And at that time, and I think it carried on for a long time, they were looking at microorganisms because it was something they could culture. 
whether there were different, but there were different methods for extracting even uh, nematodes, numbers of different methods, whether or not they were animal parasites, not animal parasites, whether they were plant pathogens, how do you extract these to look at them? But what they did know in 1941 was that each soil had its own characteristic community and microbes, and we would assume that he was talking about animals. And at the same time in, the, in uh, Aldo Leopold, who was uh, more with USGS and kind of looking at land says, we rarely consider everything together, the wild flora and the wild fauna together. Uh, and yet they build the soil, they were important to structuring soil and building soil, and they may be important to its maintenance. And so when we think about sustainability long-term, this is something that has become more and more a subject of what does everything in the soil do? Soils are at the center of global agendas. And I think it's really important that, that people are recognizing this. And I don't mean just scientists, but scientists above ground, many different people, including policymakers are recognizing that water, you know, that we're, we're losing water. They're thinking about water. They're thinking about rainfall. We've got the climate convention, desertification. And this is, these are all UN bodies, UN convention to combat, um, committee to combat desertification, the World Health Organization, the Convention on Biological Diversity, Food Security. So all these, these issues that we are now seeing relate with soil at the center of it. And there's now a global soil partnership where all these people representing these various UN bodies get together and say, globally, we've got an issue. Soils are in trouble. What can we do about it? And so meeting the sustainability development goals, you know, the first time I looked at these goals, I can't remember when they came out. My first things were, oh my God, there's only about one that would have to do with terrestrial uh, 15 life on land. But when you look at poverty and you look at zero hunger, we know that all these sustainability development goals, the most of them have something to do with soil. And so how to make this sustainable and reach these goals and help everybody reach these goals in terms of equity. In top of that, in July of last year, we got a real wake up call when two bodies that hadn't met together, a group of scientists that formed the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change and the Intergovernmental Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services got together and worked on a report together and came out of it saying that you cannot find climate solutions to this climate change issue that we've got unless we consider biodiversity also. Unless we consider what nature does for us, what all the life on earth does for us, including, I say, they didn't say, but I say in the soil. Well, this is kind of the response when this report came out and some universities have actually taken this on and said, how are we going to meet this very urgent demand and think about the complexity. And I love this particular uh, headline that came out that said astonishingly hyperconnected. And that's life on earth and the climate change and the feedbacks on regulating CO2, methane, and what we put into the air and the issues that we're gonna have with weather, with, with climate. Don't wanna say weather. So are we really maximizing our potential to urgently address these changes if we don't consider all the big pieces that we have on earth and soils and soil biodiversity are not included. I can tell you right now that the CBD uh, going forward on the framework does not mention soil biodiversity so far, and yet soil biodiversity, a lot of us who are scientists in work, whether we're zoologists, whether we're plant pathogens, whether we're, you know, looking at biodiversity, thinking about it in terms of what does it do for our health, think that we have enough research, enough science background to think about all soils on earth and the linkage between them. And whether we want to have policies to protect soil and that is now starting to happen. So if we don't consider all the information, I think we're missing out on coming up with some of our solutions. 
So about six of us got together 11 years ago and we're all scientists and said, we need to get our knowledge and find out what, what's really the status of what we know about soil biodiversity. Are, is, is most of life, except for what causes disease, in soil, in a black box, and we're never going to unravel it, we're never going to know, we're never going to be able to use it to predict. And so we started the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, and it's just a scientific effort of volunteers. Uh, there's about 4,000 now, and the first thing we did was team up with the European Commission and try to get a book that talked about each of the organism taxa that occur in soils, what they do, and then in ecos each ecosystem, each biome of the world, what, what do we know that was found? And it was a lot of, I've got to admit, it's a lot of pictures. It's great for kids. It's great for teachers in high schools. Uh, and it's free. A lot of people order the hard copy. But that was the first thing we did. And the European Commission had been doing soil atlases of various continents. So it kind of fit together that we would start one that would look at what little we knew about soil life. More recently though, in 2020, December of 2020, over 300 scientists around the world contributed to the state of knowledge of soil biodiversity. And this is the first uh, assessment that we know of, of what do we know about soil biodiversity, the different organisms, what they do, their interactions, numbers of species, invasive species, and, uh, you know, it's very rudimentary, but I would remind people that the first IPCC models were not great either. You know, they were the first step and that's basically what we are. And I put the QR code here. So in case anybody wants to look that up or the other part of it. So what do we know? We know that not soils are habitats for lots of different biota and that these together are essential for soil formation. We're talking about here for soil biodiversity, invertebrates and microbes. And together they regulate key ecosystem processes in helping to move carbon through the soil, helping to make waterways through the soil, the porosity, bring aggregates together for carbon. We also know that soils are threatened. Uh, there's a lot of disturbance to soils and this reduces soil biodiversity, the organisms in soil, not only abundance, but we can assume some of the species and some of the larger animals, we know about that, like ants, termites, species. But in the past 20 years, the information on soil biodiversity has just accelerated, much like what we know in, under microscopes and with uh, molecular tools and using stable isotopes and all, all sorts of techniques, the precisions of mass specs, all our tools have become more precise and we're able to ask better questions. So let's look at what we do know. When I'm talking about soil biodiversity, I'm talking about an estimated one quarter of the biodiversity on earth is below ground in soils, one quarter. Now that's gonna be plus or minus, but look at these boxes that we're talking about, from mycorrhizae to, to vertebrates live in soil. Soil is their habitat. And when we talk about soil without talking about the many organisms that live in soil, we're kind of missing the picture and we forget that these organisms are all have jobs and are interacting below ground. We also know, of course, that larger above ground species, and this is you know, you can just see the line here, mammals to Lepidoptera. And then all the black parts of the pie down here is what is less known. And here it's just nematodes, columbula, compared to what we know. There's a lot more green above ground, a lot more species known above ground. But we can take that and we've now started to work more together, collaborations. Uh, for example, this is a project that took up a bunch of years, a couple of years, or well, three years probably, again, it's a QR code, but we were able to get data from museums, uh, from around the world, put this data together and say, can we say, what is the distribution of soil biota? Now, somebody says, well, what are, what good are maps? Who do, why do we care where, where these species are? Well, I think it makes a lot of difference when you start thinking about land management. Here is a match between above and below ground biodiversity. 
And the turquoise is where there are more, there's more above ground species. The yellow is above ground species. So turquoise is, is soil and yellow is above ground diversity and they don't match too well. You can see them matching over here. But when we think about land managing in conservation areas in national parks, does it necessarily mean that because we see more diversity above ground, we're gonna have the same amount of biodiversity below ground. So in terms of planning for fertile soils and thinking about biodiversity, we need to know some of this information and where the matches are. We know that all these species are organized in food webs, very much like we have food webs above ground. These food webs here, you can just see a leaf falls off the tree and there's a whole transformation of that that litter by larger organisms that rip and tear it apart. Fungi, roots, mycorrhizae, the, the rhizosphere, they're all different habitats and different organisms are playing a part. And within the, each one of these boxes in this food web, just very much like a shark and the food web in the oceans or the wolves here, uh, we see predators all the way down the food chain and nutrients turning over in the soil. And we also know that this is all very threatened. There are many disturbances to soil. You know, besides erosion, their concrete, we're paving it all up. There's mining, pollution. So a number of things are happening to soils and soils are degrading as we expand our cities out, maybe not up. And so this, this leads us to what happens with this disturbance? And in general, we see that in a, a complex food web, and this is all these dots are little species, and this is one like I just showed you with the predators at the top of the food web, and then they're all feeding on somebody else, and this is the basic carbon source. But you go through a disturbance, whether it's a global change, land use change, agricultural intensification, and you get a collapsed food web with fewer species in each one of these boxes. And we get loss of function. We also know that we haven't studied soil invertebrates and soil dwelling larval stages of flying insects that use soil. They've been neglected in many studies, databases and assessments. And so it's difficult to see how we have conservation actions and policies. And so there are a number around the world because there's not an expert on every organism, every taxa in the soil. They're building global collaborations of people who know about various animals in the soil to come up with what do we know and how do we manage soil? Do we need to keep these? Not, what are we giving up? It was a paper published that we did in 2006, and we talked about the tie from habitat loss and this collapse of the food web and the decline of ecosystem services. So now what I'm gonna do is tell you what is some of the science behind the ecosystem services, the benefits we get from these soil food webs. And also I just wanted to bring this up because with COVID and everyone talking about you know, zoonotic diseases, I think it's, it's also possible that we have been thinking about this for a long time, but because we've been in our various disciplines of plant, animal health, veterinary health, wildlife, whatever, we're just now seeing how to really test this and see what we can do about it in a sustainable fashion. So I'm gonna talk about a number of ecosystem services, soil fertility, human health, biological control. I'm not gonna talk about all of them, I'll pick out some. Um, that are just, you know, wildlife, food above ground depends on soil organisms. We've got clean water, climate regulation, erosion control. Climate regulation, of course, is the big one. How do we sequester carbon, get the CO2 out of the air? How can we manage that better? And there's all, that's becoming a big, big opportunity uh, for reducing climate change. But let me just take some of these. I'll start off with one about, you know, and I'm bringing you these as a piece of a puzzle. And this is just one puzzle. This isn't somebody's head. This is a piece of a puzzle 
that as you put it back together, soil is the cornerstone of a lot of services that we get that we don't think about. And we could possibly lose as we have loss of life and soils. This is just, um, just a review. There's many reviews out now on the ecology of soil carbon and what the biotic controls have to do with it. And there's different ways of, there's different knowledge we can gain from looking at different, uh, by pulling each other together and, and uniting, we come up with novel ways to assess what is going on below ground. One way that was recently done that was global was to take a lot of nematode data sampling around the world and say, how much do nematodes contribute to carbon cycling? And so by looking at people's, everybody sent in their data and it took a couple of years to pull it all together. We can say that our estimate is that global soil bio, biomass, nematode biomass is about uh, three hundredths of a gigaton of carbon. Well, that may not mean very much to you, it's pretty small, but you've got all those other organisms in soils. So they're a reservoir of carbon that helps to move the broken down carbon pieces into various, um, various forms of carbon. And then we've also got what they emit. So that's one way of looking at it. Another way is to warm up soils and treat them with carbon or treat them with nutrients whatever, and see how climate change would affect a particular group or a particular species. And this is some work that uh, we did on some experiments for about 26 years of warming the soils up in Antarctica. Now this sounds crazy, but we were able to do it because there's only one or two species of nematodes in the soil. There's no plant life. We don't have roots to mess with. And so we could really see the changes that were occurring, not only in the whole ecosystem, and I was working with teams of, eco, uh, teams of people in ecosystems from geochemists uh, to microbial people. And we looked at this and we said, okay, so what does it matter that we lose this one little species that feeds on bacteria in soils? And our estimate was that on the short term, we would see a decline, that these weren't really resilient species in Antarctica in the soil. The nematode was not resilient. And we saw a reduction, you know, using um, stable isotopes, we were able to estimate um, soil carbon cycling. Another experiment we've done here is to use rainout shelters in three different places across the Great Plains, from Kansas uh, down into New Mexico, put out these rainout shelters and give them the maximum drought for that particular area. And what we saw was that if we went into a drought, if we had a drought, the predators declined while the plant parasites, Pratolacus, would uh, increase. And so the, the predation on the root feeders seemed to be gone. So that was one way, but there are other ways of looking at the organisms in soil. Here is one that's out of, I've got my notes down here, 235 natural ecosystems plus uh, nine years of field experiments went into this for these three fungi to get a global estimate of what was going to happen in the future with warming. And what they saw was that warming was going to increase these, these, um, these three different fungi differently. So that's another way that people have been testing and going together as groups to say, what do we need to test? What novel experiments do we need to say whether or not particular species or groups of species or functional groups work? One of the things that's more recent is, here's all the pieces of the puzzle together, and I'm not gonna talk about uh, food for wildlife above ground and how that, that uh, helps wildlife species that are even on the conservation, I mean, on the red list. Um, but here, what we're gonna do is look at multiple benefits. So one of the things that's been happening is experiments where people look at multiple functions. So of all these services I've given you, like. Do they just do carbon? Do they do nitrogen? Do they also help with water porosity, infiltration into soil, preventing erosion, human health? What is it? Do they become pathogens? And so this experiment by WAG et al. showed that as they increased diversity, they also saw more, uh, an increase in functions that were occurring 
and, and not only the number of them, but the um, benefit of them. And so Veris et al. work was really clever and it was a lot, also a lot of work. Uh, in that one, I've forgotten how many, something like 4,600 or more different taxa that were looking and they looked at, I think nine or so trophy groups from above ground grazers on plants to the plants themselves, the micro, my, microbial decomposers and then the animals all the way down. And they said, what would happen if you had fewer species in each one of these boxes? each one of these trophic levels. And what they found out was they would, they still got function if they reduced the number of species, but if they wiped out, if all the species were wiped out of a particular trophic group, then there was not adequate carbon, nitrogen, water infiltration. Another experiment that was done across Europe that compared the same and different types of agriculture intensive or not, across along uh, east, west, north, south have showed, and this says this, and they measured a lot of ecosystem processes that um, soil biota need to be included when we're thinking about modeling in the future about how to conserve biodiversity in our ecosystem services. So there's a lot of evidence in the, and you'll notice that some of these papers are 2013, 2014, some of them have been disproven of in terms of where, where that could occur or not. But let's get into now, what about humanity? We mentioned food, of course, and agricultural sustainability. But the thing I'd like to mention now is that reemphasize that there are, of course, lots of organisms eating each other in these trophic food webs and the feedbacks. And we can't possibly know all the species in the soil and what's going on. So it's like a buffer situation. Can we increase or, or um, encourage or somehow manage to get a more holistic soil? And that is a lot of what the, the concept of soil health is, is let's, let's do that for agriculture. But we're thinking, what do we have to do for all soils? Because we're going to need them in the future. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of uh, Coccidio oides, and I was just reading a paper the other day that came out, uh, I think it was Gade or Comrie, I'm not sure which, and they were just looking at if the soils just blow, do we see a higher incidence of this fungus, the two species of this fungus? And the answer was no, that they don't. The soil has to be disturbed. If the soil is disturbed, then they see uh, more disturbance. And I think what we're seeing also is that people are thinking more about this holistic approach, not only with that brings in, um, you know, the particular field or the particular disease they're looking at, but this more idea of habitat loss and trophic collapse. And for example, here's a paper that uh, came out where they're looking at not only they're looking at the interactions of humans with livestock, aquatic reservoirs, wildlife, wildlife reservoirs, and soil reservoirs. So these are these sound like enormous grants, and some of them are. I mean, the, the actual research on some of these is, some days it just blows my mind. Uh, but again, here's another paper that came out, and I can't, you know, I can't comment on, on uh, all the evidence because I haven't read it thoroughly, but I just find it so interesting that we're now looking at drivers of these trying to quantify and look at, and they mention this astonishingly hyper-connected and often overlapping aspects of what is going on. And this all has to do with the life in soil and what may be occurring elsewhere, our nearness to wildlife trade. Here's a couple more if you're interested. Uh, some of this is just loss of biodiversity and habitat change. This new review came out uh, this last week about the cost. They're actually trying to look at, okay, so you lose some, some services from the soil biota or from zoonotic here, zoonotic pandemics. We're gonna start quantifying that. So it's not all about soil carbon and just plant production. Those are two services, but there's many more that we depend on. And somebody has said, um, in this Plowright quote I like, of course, but human health is the overall return from this. 
And so there are people who are studying, um, you know, asthma and whether you live in a city and whether you have access to soils and what does that do for you? And so evidence is building for or against some of these, but in general, we know that the services, the benefits we get from multifunctions in the soil can also provide solutions. So with the roots and the organisms, the rhizosphere, you know, you can look at something and say, can this soil be restored? And of course, that's the big thing, soil regeneration, uh, soil organism here, here is one in Holland. And this is a very recently plowed grassland. And what they've done is they painstakingly looked at, and I, you can't see all the names here of all these different fungivorous mites, and they've got them by order and nematodes and all the way up to, to insects. And they've looked at it. Then they've looked at 20, uh, I think it was 10 year fields and then 15 year fields. And what they're looking at this network analysis is showing is that the carbon and nitrogen is much more conserved in long term after they get to 20 or 30 years. And the interactions are stronger. In other words, there's more of them going across here than there is in one direction here. So it's kind of stabilizing the soil. Overall, what we, what we think is that the data is starting to show that poor land management without thinking about soil biodiversity leads to a loss of this ecosystem functioning that we depend on, a loss of the controls and regulations of the pest and pathogens. And it can lead to more of an increased soil-borne pathogen and pest load that then trickles down or trickles up, whichever way you're thinking about for human impacts, whether or not it's the nutrition of the food we eat or the organisms we eat. And then all this has feedbacks. So I would say that in general, what we're, we're talking about here is soil life matters for, for world health. The soils are connected, but we've got borders that have different constraints on what regulations we have. Uh, right now, I would say that Life and soil is recognized in international policy agendas. And for more reasons than one, we can think about the relevance of biodiversity conservation in soil, all these organisms, my favorite nematodes, um, and other animals and microbes in the microbiome to provide some solutions. And just as kind of an idea, uh, here would be the challenges, say, feeding a growing population, protecting the environment, improving health. And then what about the obstacles and what would soil biota do? Well, feeding a growing population might be nutrient provision and pest, and maybe the soil provided service would be we'd need to release the nutrients in crop residue rather than removing it, of course, uh, build borders, that sort of thing, management. And then on the pest, can we see resilience against pests if we have more biodiversity in that soil? And so this kind of goes up. I won't go through all these, but thinking about soil biodiversity as part of biodiversity. Remember, the Convention on Biological Diversity does not think of organisms and soils as being part of biodiversity, and they, they are. What else is going on in terms of research-wise and how we're going to meet these grand challenges? This is a volunteer network called the Soil Biodiversity Observation Network. It's global, every bit of it's volunteer, to take samples in a standardized method and to look at conserved area and a non-conserved non area. In other words, a park and some place that's not uh, a park near it. And what we're gonna do is internationally, we will look at that and say, okay, does park, the park that has been protected for above ground reasons, still protects soil biodiversity below. And over time, will we see any change with climate change? So that's one, it's a monitoring system. It's kind of like Mauna Loa, but maybe not always. And then this week, FAO has been the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN has with a number of scientists launched an international network of soil biodiversity. That's this nut sob up here. Anybody can sign up for a working group 
They've got economists that are trying to figure out, uh, you know, what happens if we conserve and protect soil biodiversity. We've got uh, working group one is looking at methods, for example. So there's a whole 200 people, scientists around the world that are going to say, and anybody can join if you want to contribute a little paragraph or your uh, ideas for consideration. And then it's also, how do you look at the taxa? How do we build capacity to identify not only, you know, the differences in, in uh, sequences and in, in microbial sequences, but also for animals? How are we doing on that? So to kind of close out, I would say that there, these uh, observation networks have never been done for soil biodiversity. And it's gonna increase, we think a lot of um, knowledge that's been hidden, that may be hidden in somebody's drawers in their office. And we're pulling that out, uh, suggesting that be pulled out and put together from paper to digitally to be used for geographic information systems. And so I'm kind of getting to the end, but I just would like to say again that um, I think there's plenty of evidence and plenty of accelerated knowledge on what soil biodiversity does now and whether it's plant health, animal plant health, or us, we've got, we've got to move from not only looking at soil health as a concept, but looking at it for all life above ground and we also have some research to do in bringing this knowledge that I'm talking about into different areas. I just wanna show you for these last couple of slides, the difference in the disciplines. When you look at, this is depth of soil sampled. This is agriculture, forestry, environmental scientists and ecologists. And you can see that the agricultural scientists are looking at 30 centimeters. But some of the ecologists are looking at not even the full depth and the sub disciplines also. So we've got to get a handle of and, and not just make predictions off the top 10 centimeters of soil or 20 centimeters of soil. And that's I just would mention to you all that if you're interested, there's a new observatory that's been funded by NSF. That's these chambers over here are three meters deep. You can put different climates in the top, different plants in the top and manipulate your experiments and they're gonna be taking grants. It's a huge collaboration to look at climate change, sustainable climate, smart soils, food, whatever. So it's like a, a brand new biosphere. And with that, I'll just close and have, I'll also suggest if you're interested in any of this, uh, just go on the website and look at the Global Soil Biodiversity. We try to keep information, you can contribute, we have blogs but most of all, we try to keep up with what the EU and other nations are doing now to conserve soil biodiversity, even if we don't get it in the Convention on Biological Diversity. So I'd like to just thank everybody and uh, I'll stop now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Diana. Um, it was a very nice talk. Um, I'm looking, I want, I forgot before to say that if you have a question, you can put it either in the chat or in the Q&A or just raise your hand so you can um, ask your question directly to Diana. Um, so does anybody have a question? I don't see any question in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, James, do you have a question? <laughs> Bless his heart. Are you asking me? Yeah. No. Um, uh, I'm I'm ruminating. Okay. So <laughs> I can ask then my question. Um, so you were you talking you know, about soil biodiversity, how we provide solution, and um, the ma major you had a slides with the major obstacles. Um, now, um, how important is how we communicate to the soil manager. You know, it can be a rancher, it can be a farmer. Um, how do we change their perception on, you know, this relationship between the soil health and the crop yield? Um, very often when you talk to them, you know, you provide um, presentation and solution to increase carbon, uh, to increase, you know, to improve microbiome in the soil, you know, they come back to you and, and, and say, um, and focus more 
on the uh, other aspect, you know, the business, the economics, uh, uh, the chemical and the biophysical property of the soil. Um, how important is, what do you think about communicating to the soil manager and improving, you know, uh, rewarding positive externality? Um, if you are using a practice that, you know, is improving carbon uh, sequestration, uh, would that be a good solution to um, tackle this, this obstacle that you were um, showing? I think I think you you've already answered the question. I think a lot, and that's why in this um, you know in this new international network where we're trying to get people to get together with their knowledge and including, I should have said this, we're, it's including not only the economists but the growers and the farmers that have to have the economics. Uh, you know, they've got to live in various parts of the world. But I think that the soil health concept is really tremendous for agriculture. Uh, and that we need to provide more evidence as we're going to get everybody to be aware of it because, you know, there is an urgency to what's going on with climate change and we just can't keep waiting. We, we need to know what works in what region. And I know from, you know, talking to some people at the at University of California that there are growers that are extremely savvy about uh, not only carbon sequestration, but but, um, and, and around here too, I mean, using um, soil health as a concept to build up the soil to, they may not be building it for soil organisms uh, in particular, but they, they are building it so that we have the base of carbon in the soil for more diversity, hopefully. And so I think these are, you know, they're, they're um, both, they both need to be backed by science. And that's, I think, where we're feeling like the scientists that have been ecologists uh, or farmers in many parts of the world don't speak you know, to others and communi that communication is huge. And so there's a, there's a number of people who, um, at least on Twitter, you know, they just, they're starting to take pictures of all the soil animals and say what they eat and put it up for kids and there's kids books coming out. But that still may be a generation before we get people to think of the soil as being for our, our health. And I mean, I think that's a, that's a big concept to get that if we take care of soils, it can be beneficial for our kids health and human health. Yeah, completely agree. Um, there is one question from Emma uh, Gachomo, Professor Gachomo. Her question is, how does the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative interact with policymakers? Very well, there were a bunch of them on. Today was the economic day. This is the first meeting of what this is going on with. And so uh, this, the GSBI, if, I don't know if you can still see the screen sharing thing I've got up here. But the Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative, we were astounded when they said we would be one of the, it's this little box on the arrow. There are all these acronyms. It takes me forever to learn these acronyms. But the GSBI one I know is Global Soil Biodiversity Initiative. And so that's kind of like, not only are there scientists and growers and economists and every policymakers and all these other working groups and fields, but they said, okay, you know, GSBI, we need you as, as scientists um, above and below ground, ecologists, whatever, uh, zoologists to be involved in this and help help provide the evidence that we need. Okay, thank you. Um, and then there is another question, and this time it's from Colin Todd, and he's saying, do you think there is a relationship between soil biodiversity and the evolution slash emergence of novel plant pathogens? I was hoping somebody would tell me that. If you notice, I don't have a whole lot of plant pathology in there because I haven't been at Riverside in a long time and I need somebody to tell me the latest. Um, I, for, for nematodes, I think, you know, there's a lot of information and that's just my one little level. But for fungi and bacteria uh, that are pathogens and how they interact in the microbiome, since we're learning more about the microbiome, uh, around roots. I'm not as up to speed in all honesty. 
So I have a question. Okay. Um, so uh, Curtis Soddle, um, uh, a marine virologist in, at UBC over maybe 15 years ago, coined the term the virus sphere um, and estimated an abundance of about 10 to the power of 30 viruses uh, in, in the ocean water and, and marine and, and fresh water. I, and one of your earlier slides, you show um, that some virus diversity and those, um, a lot of them were human or animal viruses. Yeah. So I'm wondering what, how much is known about viral diversity in the soil? Um, you know, I think that that's, that's um, well, I've, I've just hired a new postdoc actually. Uh, who has worked some on that. And one of, one of the things that we need to do, it's, it's mentioned in the state of knowledge uh, book, that assessment, but I can't give you what, it's not a whole lot. It's very much like to me, protease, rotifers, and tardigrades, but viruses are gonna be even bigger than that because they're just, from what everybody tells me, there's just so many, but I can't give you a quantified answer, you know, of whether that has increased or is higher than in, soils than it is in marine systems. And, and the reason for, for, for the abundance is because that the, the simply the fact that every living organisms in the soil. Well, I mean, in, in us, I, be, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Yeah. Is that would it be um, reasonable to say that the, that, that the reason that there's such a high diversity is that that every living organism in the soil would be inhabited by viruses? I don't know whether that's true or not. I mean, I'd really have to talk. To, I'd want to talk to somebody who can really tell me that. I know that uh, in many cases in the past that we haven't mentioned viruses, it was because we didn't have the expert or tech, the technique. We weren't looking for a lot of this stuff in soil. And I think now what our eyes are being blown away by um, not only the diversity, but the, the groups that we just are understudied. And when, when they show that, when they show just, you know, something like in the oceans, my God, looking at the diversity just blows your mind. And so what does that, what does that mean? And what functional groups, if, if you can say that are, what's their function, you know, in each yeah, one of these. A lot of the studies they did were using metagenomics. And yeah. so they would pick up sequences, but then hard, it would be hard pressed to say that there were any functions. Yeah. If they were just picking or if up. they were compatible, they could be compatible functions for all I know. Yeah. No, I think there's, there's so much, uh, particularly early career scientists are just knocking the talk up. They're just moving fast on these, these areas. They're so excited about the various components of, of uh, soils and the organisms and soils and how they interact and what what they do that's beneficial or not and not only what's beneficial but what specifically functions do they do thank you uh, thank you uh, it's a little bit late but there is another question from janti uh, boju and the question is so um, there seems to be uh, an impending urgency regarding soil depletion especially from an agricultural perspective. How do you see soil biodiversity interfacing with ensuring agriculture continues to have productive soil in the future? Well, I think the fact that, uh, I mean, I think it's taken a while to get the word out, but I think that most of the UN bodies um, are now knowing that not only with climate change, the fact that we've got climate change, we've got no ground cover due to wildfires and changing climate and that sort of thing, and uh, growing populations, that there's a lot of awareness now that soils, you can't have them dead. You gotta have life in soils to get these nutrients turned over. And so there's a lot more interest in um, assuring that when we think about soil, we think about it as living soil for the future of agriculture. 
we can't, um, you know, we, we, could, we can pour a lot of fertilizers on marginal land. Uh, there's changing lands that we could, could um, you know, we could move into some areas that, and, and so they're always making estimates, you know, some of these scenarios that they're doing from, uh, you know, research councils in various countries and trying to put together as a, as a global block of what do we know. And some of the scientists themselves are working on that and they're starting to include in models. Uh, there's been a big effort uh, for both agriculture and there's one over here at NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research to start including um, soil, organ, going, beyond, going beyond just soil microbial biomass. They're actually thinking about putting in animals and whatever because they control the grazing rate on microbes. So, you know, it's, it's areas to be, that are coming, but I would say that the policy makers are, are pretty aware that, um, that they could be made more aware, but I think they're pretty aware that a priority is going to have to be, where is the land and is it marginal or is it not? And what is it gonna take uh, in terms of trying to feed a population? Yeah, with climate change, I should say with climate change. I think that's the new, the new ringer, they've been thinking about it, but now getting higher ups to think about it is really important if they're gonna release monies and governments are gonna release money. Okay. I think you answered very well. And I'm looking in both the chat and the question. We don't have any more. Um, okay. So yeah, I think okay. we thank you so much for joining us.